you guys for joining me today. Why don't we start out with just a little bit about your background. Peter, would you like to talk a little bit about where you come from? Sure, so I'm Peter Morville. Uh, my academic background is in library and information science, uh, but I'm one of those crazy librarians who fell in love with the internet in the early 1990s and uh, uh, ended up becoming an information architect and uh, have uh, written a number of O'Reilly animal books along the way. Indeed, and Jorge? And I'm Jorge Arango, and um, I'm one of those crazy architects who fell in love with the internet in the early 1990s <laughs> and um, started reading books like the Polar Bear book and, and some uh, subsequent books. So I've been doing information architecture in some form for over 20 years. And so you mentioned the Polar Bear book, and along with Louis Rosenfeld, you've recently released the fourth edition. So what made now the right time to update the edition? So we are at a very interesting juncture in um, the development of design for software or for digital information environments in that we are at a point where it's become obvious that there's more to this than, the, than sitting down in front of a computer tethered to a desk. And uh, we now have uh, um, some little computers that fit in our pockets and that are connected to the internet. We have watches that display information. We have stuff all around us that is starting to get smart and, and become participants in this information ecosystem. And the principles that belie information architecture apply, uh, I think, doubly so when you have this wide variety of um, means of accessing information and producing information. And so in the 17 years since the first edition, how has the field of IA changed? It's evolved a lot. Um, when we were starting out in the mid to late 90s, uh, the focus was very much on websites and, and structuring and organizing websites so people could find what they need. Um, and over the years, uh, we've seen uh, a ver uh, various waves uh, kind of wash over our field from uh, social media to mobile and cross-channel. Um, and so, you know, we've, we've sort of evolved uh, as the world has changed, and I see information architecture now uh, as a much more mature discipline and one that uh, is quite broad. And uh, this book, this fourth edition, really was sort of written with the sort of the, the notion that information architecture isn't just for information architects anymore, information architecture for, is for everyone. Uh, and so user experience designers, even software engineers, need to know a little bit about information architecture to do their work well. Mm -hmm. And kind of related to that, how would you say the relationship between IA and UX has evolved? Yeah. Um, so when we were first uh, talking about information architecture at conferences in the mid-90s, nobody was really talking about user experience. That wasn't a term that was, it was in common use. Um, you know, in the sort of around 2000 or so, user experience started to take off as kind of a discipline or, or practice, um, and uh, and really sort of stole the limelight from information architecture for a while. And, and there was sort of a, a tension between the communities or within the community. I feel like we've, we're past that now, and there's a recognition that information architecture and user experience um, are you know need each other, um, and. Uh, and, and so we're seeing a growing recognition among user experience designers that may not have come up through the information architecture route, uh, that they need to know about this in order to do their work, uh, sort of the structuring at a deeper level. And Jorge, you alluded to this a little bit earlier, but the, the Internet of Things, how has that impacted the need for information architecture? Well, one of the advantages of thinking uh, in terms of information architecture is that it's, it's always asked that we kind of take a step back from the artifacts that are being created and think about the overall kind of semantic structure, like the system that uh, underlies it. And as we move to this world where we're accessing information environments through all these different devices, um, it becomes doubly important to think of this as kind of this abstracted layer that unites and brings coherence to all these disparate information accessing and production mechanisms, basically. And would you say that 
the IoT has affected the way we approach information architecture? Has it affected how we architect information? So the one of the tricky things kind of given the, the time that we're in where 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 the world um, is being changed very quickly through technology is that we often don't have the right vocabulary to talk mm -hmm. about things or at least to make sure we're talking about the same thing. So when I hear the, the phrase Internet of Things, to me that is a technology-centric frame and, and it, it makes me think about the things, right? Um, and uh, you know, I like to think about, the, the, you can sort of think about information architecture being more in line with Doug Engelbart's kind of notion of intelligence augmentation, mm -hmm. um, of um, helping people to have a better understanding and make more intelligent decisions, um, which is sort of a flip from AI, artificial intelligence, uh, where you're trying to make the, the machines smarter. I feel like we're starting to head into a world where those are coming together, right? Where, uh, and, and, and so there's a lot of things happening on the, in, in the Internet of Things side with machine learning and making you know making smarter things and things that talk to one another we haven't quite figured out how to bring information architecture together with that um, I was just at Mike Kunyowski's session uh, where he was talking about machine learning and he said we're we're creating a lot of really dumb Internet of Things products at the moment right and it's because um, the folks that are doing this are missing out on the user experience part how do we really um, take the technology side and marry it with the human side. So I feel like we're still very early in that. Right. And one last question for each of you. What people or projects are you following? What things are you finding personally exciting? Let's start with Peter. Um, so I've been working with um, with libraries recently. I uh, worked with uh, the Baker Library at Harvard Business School last year. Uh, I'm going to be working with the Ann Arbor Public Library uh, in the next few months. and. I'm finding it really exciting to take a, a cross-channel perspective or ecosystem perspective and look at not just the website, but look at the physical place, the people, the services, and how, how the physical and digital interact. So for me, that's sort of a broader way to practice information architecture, is looking at that ecosystem. And doing it within the library context uh, is very meaningful to me because I feel that libraries are incredibly important institutions in our culture as we go forward. Jorge? I'm very excited about the work that the folks at Walt Disney Imagineering are doing. Um, I think that Disney is in a unique position in that they, they own a, um, basically an urban environment the size of a small U.S. city or a, maybe even a medium-sized U.S. city and they own it kind of soup to nuts and it's a place where people go to have experiences and they seem to be in the process of wiring that place up to uh, really kind of fulfill on the dream of the Internet of Things which is you know knowing who you are and then having the, that kind of identification aspect um, somehow change the way that you interact with the environment so I think it's very interesting some of the stuff they're doing. Well, thank you both very much for talking with me today. Thank you. Thank you.